Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. I'm coming to you actually from Munich, Germany uh, today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining. Um, and I'm at the, um, the European Federation for Laboratory Medicine meeting. Uh, so I'm gonna be giving an introductory talk on EVs tomorrow. I try to get people excited about the role of EVs in diagnostics. Um, and on that note, um, our talk today is actually about a potential new way that we can use EVs and some of their cargo um, in, in diagnosis. And our speaker today is Metka Lanasi, who is um, also uh, the presumed uh, next chair of science and meetings. So she's going to be taking over for me. So she's a very familiar face for some of you, and she will become an even more familiar face um, going forward. So Metka, you're also not very far away from where I am right now no. geographically uh, in, in Slovenia. So uh, thanks so much for presenting to us today. And I'd like to hand the screen sharing over to you. So thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, just a, a quick, um, so Ken already mentioned Slovenia, maybe just also a quick picture of Ljubljana and our university building. So this is where I work at in Ljubljana, the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm really happy uh, to be able to present our recent work on extracellular vesicle bound DNA in urine as, indi um, as an indicative biomarker of kidney allograft injury. To make a brief introduction, um, I'm sure that everyone joining us today is aware that um, EV have a complex biomolecular structure. And um, this is similar, structure is a bit similar to cellular structure, and it consists of all types of biomolecules. Uh, mostly proteins and RNA is studied, but recently also um, lipids and metabolites are getting attention. And this complex picture was um, is recently got recent, even more complex recently um, when it was discovered that EVs also carry protein corona, so a layer of proteins that bind to the surface of EVs. But not much is known about DNA. So um, what recent public uh, recent publication showed is that um, EV DNA associates to diverse extracellular particles, so it can be associated or included in large EVs, small EVs, and also extracellular particles like exomeres. And it can be in a single-stranded form or double-stranded um, uh, molecule. It can be of genomic or mitochondrial origin. Um, and it can be short, let's say about 200 base pairs in small EVs or up to 2 million base pairs in large EVs. So there's quite a diversity. And um, EV was shown to be present in the lumen or at the surface of EVs. So a study where they induced jerked EVs with antibiotic ciprofloxacin showed that um, when these EVs were analyzed with flow cytometry, um, uh, the propidium iodide um, dye detected, EV in, uh, detected DNA in these EVs. And in another study of glioblastoma EVs, um, they could show that DNA co-localized with CD63 and CD81 um, marker. And there was um, another study um, which showed that um, prostate cancer cell oncosomes, so these are these larger EVs, um, contain DNA inside the vesicles because it is protected from nucle nuclease degra degradation, um, but um, is um, localized on the surface in small EVs because here you could see that the signal for DNA went down after um, nuclease um, degradation. And importantly, EVs for EV DNA was um, also shown to cover the entire genome, the entire, let's say, mutational um, um, profile of different cancers or tumors. And um, this study here looked at different leukemia cell lines and um, showed exactly that, that some of the um, DNA is um, protected from degradation, but some was also um, present at the um, extracellular vesicle surface. Um, what is, what's the fact about all these studies is that um, this EV DNA um, was studied in the context of cancer. And I'm sure all of you are aware that in cancer cells, um, there is a characteristic genome, in, genomic instability. If we look um, 
in, if we look at this um, simplified scheme, um, we have a normal, we have a, let's say, cancerous cell with first a normal nucleus, but um, due to, let's say, um, so um, um, changes in structure or in um, number of um, chromosomes, or maybe also due to mutations, um, this DNA can be released from the nucleus in micronuclei, and these micronuclei contain DNA. And this DNA can, in certain cases, even be released into the cytosol of these cells. So it seems that in cancer cells, um, this cytosolic DNA or DNA in general is um, more um, easily um, incorporated into EVs um, through different mechanisms. Um, there are several hypotheses, nothing proven. So um, one way of incorporation is by incorporating DNA um, from cytosol um, in large EVs by um, membrane out, um, outward invagination, or this uh, cytosolic um, DNA can be incorporated into intraluminal vesicles um, when, during the endosomal maturation. But it was also shown that micronuclei can be incorporated into um, directly into intraluminal vesicles. And there was this study that showed that um, if they induce toxicity, um, that there was more, nucle more nuclei in the um, cytosol, but also more of the released EV DNA. And what is also true um, of these studies is that EV DNA was mostly studied in blood or in cell cultures. So in urine, um, there was, I think, one study that mentioned um, DNA as a contaminant in um, RNA studies. And there was one study um, on um, that analyzed um, EV DNA in nine um, bladder cancer patients, and they were looking at um, different mutations in those patients. But um, this study was done on ICSOC quick um, um, isolated vesicles. Um, and the, also in the position paper, which I encourage you all to read if you're interested in um, EVs from urine, um, it was also very obvious that this um, cargo, so DNA cargo of um, urine EVs is maybe one of the least um, um, studied ones. So, um, with all this knowledge, um, we pose ourselves um, those two questions. So is DNA associated to EVs in cancer unrelated conditions? So this is more a general question that is not related specifically only on urine EVs. But then also, is DNA even associated to EVs in urine? And if yes, what are, what, what are the characteristics of this DNA? And um, we thought that kidney transplantation was a perfect model to study this. And just to give you a brief introduction um, on that. So um, there are several different um, causes of um, kidney failure or let's say um, of loss of function of kidneys. And this can be diabetes, kidney inflammation, hypertension, medicines, and um, so this kidney failure can be treated with dialysis, but actually the most effective treatment is kidney transplantation. And during kidney transplantation, the donor kidney um, is um, added or incorporated um, to the um, 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 to, to, to the system, to the body, to the connected to the bladder. But um, the, the two um, endogenous um, damaged kidneys are still there, but because they're not used and because they do not work, um, they get atrophied. So um, this is the only functional um, kidney then, so the donor kidney. But um, this donor kidney is also not um, completely safe from all the... Um, from injury, from all these different factors that can um, affect um, its function. So, um, of course, um, uh, because of um, immunosuppression, there can be calcineurin inhibitor toxicity. Um, the primary disease can reoccur, or um, infections are also uh, typical, let's say, with cytomegalovirus or um, BK virus. But most importantly, um, 
um, the, um, the allograft rejection can be a problem. So all these different factors can um, injure tissue, um, kidney tissue um, and affect its function. So it's really important to detect any changes in the function early to be able to respond with treatment. Otherwise, um, the, kid the kidney can be um, lost. So in Slovenia, um, there is one center for kidney transplantation, which is run by Professor Micha Arnol, who is also um, a very, um, who was also a very active collaborator on this project. Um, and uh, Slovenia is part of the Eroch transplant network, um, where organs are shared between different countries so that um, um, recipients, um, um, of the kidneys can get the perfect, um, or at least as, as perfect as possible donor match. And in Slovenia, there is about 40 to 60 deceased donor kidney transplantations per year. And to just share a bit of data, um, there's about 13% of acute allograft rejection observed within the first year after transplantation which is a good result because the, uh, worldwide these percentages are from 11 to 26 percent. And um, this results in 94 percent one-year allograft survival rate, which is similar as in the USA. And approximately 30 percent of allografts then fail within 10 years, and this is mostly due to the chronic allograft rejection. Um, so, although there's been a lot of improvement in, treat in treatment and in um, survival of these um, kidney allografts, there is a real clinical need for new non-invasive biomarkers, which would enable continuous monitoring of allograft injury, or even more specifically, rejection. And um, of course, urine DNA is a promising biomarker to do just that. Um, it, um, it is known that um, if, that, um, if let's say, from donor kidney DNA, if there's some kind of injury, um, like um, some kind of necrosis or apoptosis, that this donor DNA is released into the urine or into the bloodstream. So, um, you, uh, and because, um, and because um, this kidney transplantation is actually also genome transplantation, it's quite easy to follow this donor DNA in these body fluids. Um, during um, any injury. And this is what also uh, one seminal study, the DART study did. They showed that if they measured um, plasma donor derived cell-free DNA, that if, um, the, if the levels, the fractions of this DNA were higher than 1%, this indicated kidney allograft um, rejection, which is also shown in this graph here. Um, and we were asking ourselves another question. Another question is urine EVDNA, so um, DNA bound to um, extracellular vesicle, even a better or maybe a complementary biomarker of kidney allograft injury. And for, um, for this um, urine, it is known that um, vesicles are, of course, released from kidney, from all different um, uh, sections of the nephron, and can be also released from bladder and, of course, prostate in men, but also um, immune cells that are present in the kidney can release EVs. And also, of course, um, in certain cases, um, EVs can come also from um, the bloodstream into the, into the urine. So EVs um, could be a, a very direct measurement of, uh, EVs in urine could be a very direct measurement of what is happening in the kidneys. So we, um, we did the following study design. In the first step, we wanted to optimize um, EV enrichment from pathological urine. In the next step, um, we wanted to build a cohort of kidney transplant patients. Um, and from, there, from these patients, we would then um, enrich EV from urine and then follow up with um, um, extracellular vesicle DNA extraction. 
Um, and of course, uh, this would be followed by um, EVDNA characterization. And uh, in the final step, we would look at the association of um, EV um, DNA characteristics to kidney allograft injury. Um, but of course, uh, let's start with the first step. But of course, there are many challenges with urine. And just to name a few, let's say uromodulin can polymerase, and there's high protein concentration, there's variability in pH, variability in urine concentration, and um, urine usually also has large volumes. And to address all these challenges, um, we optimized and designed the following protocol. So we collected um, urine from patients and then 20 milliliter, um, so aliquots of 20 milliliter of urine were processed with um, centrifugation for cell removal. And then we could fr uh, freeze these samples and keep them in the freezer in, at minus 80 until use. Um, these samples were then defrosted when needed. And we um, next added EDT, um, EDTA to um, inhibit or at least pre uh, prevent to a certain extent uromodulin polymerization. And in the next step, um, we added concentrated PBS buffer to um, neutralize the pH. And then uh, we concentrated this large um, urine volumes to 500 microliters, which were um, added to the size exclusion column, which helped to remove um, proteins. And in the end, this, um, the fractions that contained EVs were, um, were, were concentrated into a smaller volume. And this um, EV sample was then analyzed by different techniques. And we could show that um, we could mostly get um, pure EVs that were um, that with NTA showed um, an unexpected size profile and contained some of the typical EV proteins. In the next step, um, we enrolled kidney transplant patients and we collected all the data and uh, samples. Um, the inclusion criteria was adult kidney transplant recipients uh, that were undergoing allograft biopsy. And this biopsy um, was a surveillance biopsy after one year or indicative biopsy when, let's say, um, um, the function of kidneys was starting to um, to change to be a bit lower. Um, and the exclusion criteria was multiple solid organ transplants or active infection. And then we collected um, data from patients that was demographic data, clinical parameters, laboratory data. Um, we actually collected a lot of this data, but um, I, here I just wanted to point out uh, urine creatinine just because we use this measure for um, data normalization. And of course, histopathologic examination was also performed. Um, this is a standard way um, how to um, evaluate or diagnose kidney injury. And based on this evaluation, we um, stratified patients in, th in three groups. That is normal histology groups, and they didn't have any abnormalities um, in um, this allograft tissue. And then the rejection group, um, we identified um, antibody-mediated rejection or T-cell-mediated rejection. And then there was also a non-rejection group where they could detect um, some kind of injury, some changes in the allograft, but um, they, this didn't, um, they were not um, rejection um, changes. Um, didn't, they didn't meet this rejection criteria. Okay. And um, samples were also collected. Uh, we collected se second morning spot urine sample, um, then um, venous blood, which we process into plasma and blood cells. And of course, um, tissue biopsy was also collected for all patients. Um, we next uh, wanted to um, be sure that even in pathological um, urine, our method for EV separation or EV enrichment will work. So what we did is we um, analyzed um, several patients with normal histology, rejection injury, or non-rejection injury, um, and um, 
just looked at, um, we processed um, the samples with a SEG-based method um, and showed, and sh as you can see here, uh, we showed that in all these different types of injuries, we could um, collect a relatively pure, or I would say quite pure EV sample. There was um, only in this rejection injury, you could see some, um, some proteins that were also there. But otherwise, um, the method was successful in um, enrichment of EVs. And when we analyze these EVs with NTA, uh, we could show that concentration um, between different patients group didn't change. So um, when we compared um, one or other, so rejection or non-rejection injury to normal um, kidneys, a normal allograft, um, there was no main, major, no significant difference. But we could observe a significant difference in EV size um, because when, um, because in samples with injury, um, vesicles were larger compared to um, samples with um, normal histology. In the next step, we then um, just um, as I said, we isolated uh, with SEC all these um, EVs from all these different um, patients, um, and we next proceeded with DNA extraction. So for DNA extraction, we had to do the donor genomic DNA extraction, recipient genomic DNA extraction, extraction of DNA from um, urine EV samples and uh, extraction from, um, of cell-free DNA from urine. And in most, in all these three different, first three different cases, this was really straightforward. We just used uh, kids um, and there was, yeah, it was a straightforward process, but for the cell-free DNA, it was a bit more complicated. Um, so we tested five different um, kits that are commercially available. And here I present data for three kits that were most successful. Um, and we could show that um, quick DNA urine kit from Zymo research was most, uh, most successful in um, isolating um, higher amounts of DNA. And um, as shown at this um, electrophoresis um, diagram, this um, cell-free DNA had two peaks. So we did collect smaller DNA fragments, but also larger ones. Um, and um, another good thing about this Zymo kit is that it is quite cheap, let's say cheaper, most cheaper than the others, and that it also is um, easy to handle. So that's why we, for all the samples, we proceeded with isolation um, with this kit. And then um, the next step was to characterize um, DNA that was extracted from EVs and also from cell-free DNA. And we measured with fluorometer DNA yield, um, which is really straightforward. We just measured concentration of DNA that was then calculated as an absolute value. Um, and also, um, we've also performed droplet digital PCR for several different DNA characteristics. So the, the good thing about droplet digital PCR is that it can offer absolute quantification compared to quantitative PCR. Um, and just a brief, very brief introduction into the method. Um, this is possible, this absolute quantification is possible because um, you, um, so you dilute sample in a way that when you make these small um, drops, um, each drop contains um, ideally only one DNA uh, molecule or none. And then PCR reaction actually takes place in all of these different uh, drops, which means that if one drop is positive, um, that drop contained one molecule. So a really straightforward uh, method for quantification. And from with this um, DDPCR analysis, we could um, determine DNA copy number. And this was spe uh, specifically, we measured the RPP30 gene. And for the DNA integrity index, which I will come back to it later on in the presentation, um, we measured RPPH1 and RPP30 gene. 
Um, we selected these genes because they are um, present only in one copy in the haploid genome, and these genes are also used in um, in gene copy variation studies. And what is nice is that they're also of different sizes, um, so they, um, they can help with the measuring um, of degradation of DNA. And then the next parameter was uh, donor-derived DNA fraction. And this was a bit more complicated to do because we first had to genotype um, um, the donor and the recipient and then um, identify um, the SNPs in which these two um, genomes uh, differed. And, and so this was the hard part. But after that, we would just um, um, analyze two SNPs for, for each um, um, patient um, um, donor combination. And from these two SNPs, we would quantify them and calculate um, the fraction, the copy number of DNA, DNA. And from then, from that data, we would calculate DNA fraction. So it was not so hard as it seemed because we could actually identify six SNPs and also um, so one amplicon that was located on the Y chromosome that were able to differentiate all of our patients. So it was not, um, we didn't have to genome the whole, we didn't have to sequence the whole genome. And uh, another, um, DNA measurement that we do did was donor derived copy number, um, where we just multiplied the DD DNA fraction with the DNA copy number. Okay, and um, in the first um, next step, we wanted to um, just analyze if DNA is even present if it co purifies or co enriches with um, EVs from urine. And we could um, support that with three different measurements. So um, if we measured DNA yield, which was normalized to urine creatinine, um, similar to DNA copies. So if we measured this DNA yield or DNA copies, we could show um, that um, DNA was present, was co-enriched with EVs. But you can see that there is uh, quite an interval of different values for this um, DNA. So the quantity differs much in different samples. And um, we could just as a comparison, we also analyze cell-free DNA. And you can see here that cell-free DNA, um, extraction of cell-free DNA was much more efficient. Um, but we could show that in both cases, um, the measurements correlated and also DNA yield uh, for EVs correlated with uh, DNA copies for EVs. So um, yes, the, it seems that um, DNA, EV DNA and cell-free DNA have um, few similar characteristics. And when we specifically looked at donor-derived DNA fractions, uh, we could again show that donor-derived DNA is present in EV isolates from urine. Again, it could be um, almost absent, but um, then present in almost up to 100% um, fraction um, of the total DNA. Um, and again, the, these two, the DD cell-free DNA and DD EV DNA fraction uh, correlated. But of course, um, we were next. In, um, we were next interested in the fragmentation or in degradation of this um, DNA because there is a lot of nucleases present in the urine. Um, so we just wanted to check in maybe if maybe EV DNA was a bit protected from this de um, degradation. And we could support this um, with our analysis. So what we did was we measured those two, um, or we amplified those two genes, the RPPH1 and RPP30 gene. And we just um, then um, um, calculated the ratio of these amplicon copies. Um, and in a normal undegraded sample, you would, um, you would suppose or you would expect that this DNA integrity index would have a value of one. 
But if DNA is degraded, um, of course, um, and DNA that is larger would probably, um, I mean, the amplicon that is larger would probably be more affected with this uh, degradation. So you would expect that this value would get much lower compared to this value. So if, if DNA is more degraded, um, this factor would have lower values. And this is what we could show for the cell-free DNA. All the values for the cell-free DNA uh, were much lower compared to the um, DNA that was um, co-isolated with EVs from urine. And this was also true if you um, just analyzed um, all these three different patient groups separately. So it seems that although there's a lot of correlation between extracellular, extracellular vesicle enriched DNA and cell free DNA, there's also this protection of EV DNA. But we didn't know if maybe EV DNA is incorporated inside EVs in prote and protected like this, that, or if there's something else happening. Um, so we performed um, DNA is one treatment of purified EVs. And as shown in this graph here, we could show that um, in all the samples that were analyzed um, after the DNA treatment, that was 30 minutes on 37 degrees, the value of DNA copies um, um, decreased a lot. Um, and we were a bit afraid that maybe DNAs, which, which are known to be quite um, robust enzymes, that maybe they were, not, um, uh, they were not inactivated by heat inactivation at 75 degrees, which is a normal way to inactivate um, the reaction. So what we did was a set of separate experiments and really showed that um, the 75 um, um, he, um, heat inactivation doesn't really work that well. So we wanted to um, check our support, our results in an independent way. So we analyzed another free sample. These are the ones that are here marked with red triangles. We analyzed another set of samples with um, inactive, direct inactivation of DNAs in the nurturing buffer that is already the first step in DNA extraction protocol. But um, despite, um, and we could show for this uh, denaturation that it was very successful in inactivating the DNA's activity. So yes, um, we could show similar to previous um, ex um, experiments that um, DNA copies are um, decline or um, um, are lower after the treatment with DNAs. So obviously um, it seems that DNA is more susceptible, DNA that is um, co-isolated with EVs is more sensitive, susceptible, susceptible to this DNA is one treatment. And, um, and this is um, regardless of the patient group. And there is actually from, I think that there was about two to 38% of um, DNA that was not degraded um, for in the samples. Uh, and this DNA might be maybe um, included um, inside of EVs or can be protected in, diff in some other ways with protein binding or something else um, from degradation. Um, to really show that um, DNA is bound to the surface of EVs, we next employed um, team immunogold um, analysis. And what we did was we um, isolated um, EVs and then bound them to the, um, to the grid for um, uh, transmission electron microscopy. Um, and next we um, um, detected DNA with antibo antibodies against double-stranded DNA. And um, in the next step detected these antibodies with, immunogo uh, with IgG antibodies um, conjugated to gold particles. And um, these are some repre representative images for all different patient groups. And you can see that in all these different samples, we could show that these gold particles um, were bound to the surface of EVs, um, which was for us indicated that um, DNA um, is bound at least partly um, to EV surface um, in urine. 
And maybe just to point out another thing, um, is there is, um, so in, from the literature, we learned that five millimolar EDTA already successfully flashes away, detaches um, DNA from cell surface. Um, but in our case, we actually had eight millimolar EDTA present in urine. That means that the DNA that we detected here is probably more strongly bound to EVIS. Um, and of course, we um, um, next wanted to evaluate if um, this, how this EV um, DNA, if it associates with characteristics um, of kidney allograft um, injury. And um, to, to recap these um, observations, we did show that more DNA was bound to urine EVs in patients that had allograft injury. So if we look specifically at these different DNA characteristics, um, we could show that um, for normalized DNA yield, um, that there was a significant difference between all these three patient groups. And if we performed pair, pairwise um, 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 okay, analysis, um, we could see that um, the um, that EVIS um, in the rejection group had more DNA um, bound to EVIS compared to um, the normal um, patient group. And similar was shown for the um, DNA copy number. So specifically rejection group and non-rejection group had more DNA copies compared to the normal patient group. Um, this was not so straightforward in the um, normalized donor-derived um, DNA copies. Um, so in this case, um, the, the, we could not, there was some trend, you can see, you can observe some trend that um, patient groups with injury have a bit more of these donor-derived DNA copies compared to normal um, patient group, but this, is, this was not statistically significant. Um, so, but we did what was interesting and what we did um, show was that um, the, um, the antibody mediated rejection, so these are these full uh, triangles here, differ significantly from um, the measurements of um, this um, DDDNA copies in uh, T cell mediated rejection group. So there, I think that there is, um, um, we just have to improve the, or get larger numbers of patients with rejection and uh, in general increase the um, cohort um, size to be able to again, look into these um, DDDNA copies. And urinary EV DNA characteristics also reflected um, um, inflammation in different kidney parts. Let's say for the interstitial inflammation, we could show that e normalized EV DNA yield, EV DNA copy, or um, DD EV DNA copy, um, they were all significantly um, higher in um, patients that had higher BAMF scores. So scores that were more than zero. And this BAMF score more than zero um, evaluates or um, um, evaluates that there is an inflammatory lesion happening um, to, and of course this lesion has um, different grades. So it's um, different levels of inflammation are scored with one, two, three. But if um, let's say for the bound score zero, there is absence of inflammation or there is evidence of less than 10% of inflammation in biopsy tissue. And what we could also observe and what was expected is that, of course, the patients with um, higher BAM scores were the one that had um, diagnosed um, rejection injury. And then for the glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis, we could similarly show that um, there were um, higher values of all these three different DNA characteristics in patients with higher BAM scores. And again, these uh, higher bound scores were, um, were expected to be present in patients that had antibody mediated rejection. And the last parameter um, that was um, that 
um, I'm presenting here is inflammation in area of fibrosis. And we could also show that EV DNA copy number um, um, was um, significantly um, higher in BAM scores, uh, in patients with BAM scores more than zero. And in um, these patients um, were the ones that had um, rejection injury or non-rejection injury. So this really shows only is connected to um, injury of um, allograft. So altogether, it seems that um, urinary EVs um, really do reflect kidney allograft injury and would be really an interesting um, putative biomarker of this to study in the future. And to just make some conclusions, um, so the size exclusion based method didn't reach pure EVs from pathological urine. And we could show that most of the DNA that was bound to EVs in urine is located on EV surface. Urinary EV DNA and cell-free DNA um, correlated in several characteristics, but importantly, EV DNA appeared less fragmented, so was um, more protected from degradation. Um, and as already mentioned, EV DNA reflects kidney allograft injury and the severity of inflammation in specific compartments of kidney allograft or um, biopsy specimens. So um, that means that EV is a promising biomarker for kidney allograft injury, but um, we should, of course, further validate this in larger cohort studies. Um, and um, I would just like to point out that this paper is under review and um, should be very soon accessible at medical archives. So you, you can access more data um, there. In the end, I would just like to acknowledge um, a great group of, of people, collaborators. Um, as I already mentioned, this was a great collaboration with our clinical partner, Micha Arnold from the um, University Medical Center Ljubljana and his PhD student, Ivana Sede, who really contributed um, greatly to this study. And um, Maya Stalikar from National Institute of Biology really brought her knowledge of digital PCR to the, to the project. So um, thank you. And um, Magda performed um, all the electron microscopy uh, analysis, uh, while Katya Gurichar um, um, performed statistical analysis. And of course, I would also like to um, thank my other members of the team, uh, especially Maria, who helped make some nice pictures for this presentation. And thank you, of course, for your, um, for your attention and for taking your time today um, to listen to this talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Medka. Uh, this is a ridiculous amount of work, and it ranges everywhere from uh, checking out the different DNA isolation kits to uh, to the really exciting biology, I think, that you're uncovering here. So um, so thank you for that, and uh, congratulations to you and your team. Uh, we do have some questions that are coming in in the chat box, um, so I'll go ahead. I, I have a few, too, that I'd like to ask, but let's, um, let's let others um, jump in here first. So um, as, as a reminder, if you have a question for Metka, please put it into the chat box so that I can, uh, I can, I can get to you. And I'm going to um, gonna, gonna read out your name and ask you to unmute yourself. So I'm allowing unmuting now. So please be ready with your microphone. And if you can't use the microphone, just, just uh, let me know in the chat box. So let us start with L Block. Hi, um, thank you. I had a question about the EM images. Beautiful, by the way. Um, for the gold labeling, it, um, when you gold labeled for DNA, did you see any on the inside of any of the particles? And would you expect to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with August. that method? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, actually we could. So in this analysis, um, we um, didn't perme permeabilize the EVs. So we would have to do that with some kind of detergent or something to, to really go inside. But um, because in most cases, um, um, DNA was um, present like you know in larger amounts on outside so I think that the mean um, I think about 12 percent was the mean level of um, DNA that was inside of EV so we just didn't look at that but I think that with 
um, probably quite a lot of more work, um, but in optimization, we could also look at that. Um, but we did, of course, I didn't show this here, but we did check that if you um, um, didn't use the, um, so just like controls for all these different, for, um, for, double, for these antibodies against double-stranded DNA, that um, there was non, there was not uh, unspecific binding in that. And we could show that um, if there was some like this really large filament of uromodulin that, um, so anti-EGG, so EGG um, conjugated antibodies did bind. So not, a, the, not against the DNA, but just the secondary antibodies could bind, but to really obvious um, long filaments. So yeah. Mecca, let me just make sure that I understood the answer there. Oh, when you okay. said 12%, was that was that from the gold labeling or was that from the protection study? So that was from the protection, yeah. Okay. That was and as, and as you said, you, you 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 aren't you can't rule out that some of that was still on the outside, right? It's just that no, it was no, there, no, no, no. Yeah. It could be maybe protected with proteins or maybe inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know. Very good. Good. Okay, so from one L to somebody with two L's in their name, Lucia <laughs> Languino. Oh, hi. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mekta. It was a great talk. So I guess the obvious question, where are this EV coming from? And where is mm -hmm. the DNA binding occurs? Especially mm -hmm. because I work on prostate, of course, there is mm -hmm. a possibility that it's a, a prostatic origin, but mm -hmm. yes. you know already? Yeah, so, um, so we actually don't know where, it, where the DNA comes from. I would say it does seem that EV DNA and cell-free DNA have the same origin. Um, because of it more seems that maybe EV DNA on EVs is just more protected. So my guess, but this is without any, you know, data supporting that, my guess would be that maybe um, DNA is bound to the self surface. I mean, this is known that DNA is bound to the self surface. And that um, while um, during the invagination of blabbing of the membrane, during the production of vesicles at the membrane, this DNA just stays bound to the EVs. So this could be just direct binding, or maybe immediately when EVs are released, they would bind um, the cell-free DNA, which what is really cell-free DNA is just DNA that is out there. You know, maybe part, um, part of the cell-free DNA is also now EV DNA, but you know, it's, it's a kind of like a complicated terms. They, they can mean also the same. So, it yeah. could be that it's also bound later on, but that would mean that it would have to bind really quickly. Otherwise, it would be degraded similar to... Yes. And, and sorry, Meta, to start with, the question yeah. in addition to the DNA, yeah, thank you yeah. for, for your answer. Where are the vesicles coming from? Oh, the vesicles. Sorry, sorry. So, of course, we don't know that. We didn't look specifically for markers of um, different... Um, let's say of if this is really just kidney, I would suppose that it's not only kidney, but we did detect donor derived DNA and this is only present in kidneys. So at Good least, point. yeah, so in, in some cases, almost 100% of DNA was actually donor derived DNA. So okay. it seems that, um, you know, Probably there's a, a large amount, but I have to be, oh, um, I have to be open about it and say that we did observe some differences, so sex-related differences in EV DNA characteristics. So it could be that also, you know, prostate cancer or you know, not prostate cancer, prostate um, and other um, organs or could contribute um, to these changes. Yeah. Yeah, although donor could be leukocyte infiltrated in the kidney. So just FYI, I don't want to take more time. But. Okay, yeah. Um, so you mean that um, the recipients, recipients' immune cells could be infiltrating into the donor? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. There could so, be a mixture. Okay. Yeah, and this yeah, is definitely, yeah. a, this is also a question that Sandra Brennan had. So Sandra, if, if you want to jump in here, if you have any follow-up, uh, please feel free. Mine was more, yeah, cell type, no? I, th mm -hmm. I think someone mm -hmm. else was also asking if they are coming mm -hmm. from epithelial cells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, whether you checked for, I don't know, a cell specific markers on these mm -hmm. EVs. Mm -hmm. And uh, also now I was thinking, uh, do you have many, uh, any idea why the DNA bound to the EVs is more protected? So you mentioned proteins. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's a nice yeah. talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so, so did I answer all the questions? So, for the self type, um, um, this was, you know, this is just the start of our study. As I said, it's great because we are actually collaborating on a clinically relevant pro um, problem, but we are trying to also do some basic studies. So um, just more fundamental, learn about fundamental things. And this is definitely another step that we want to do in, in the studies to just really show with protein, um, with some surface markers where these vesicles are coming from. So I, would I cannot really you know, say anything more specific about it. Um, we don't have any data on that. Um, so for the, um, uh, the other question was about, um, um, let me remember the last part. What was the proteins uh, that are protecting? Oh no! So the, the protection. So again, you know, um, what I would imagine or I would suppose is that um, the surface of, of Evis is not, you know, kind of like flat and completely accessible to all these DNAs. It could be that um, just by binding on the surface. Um, the, there is some kind of steric hindrance for the DNA is to attack um, this DNA. And um, if we, there are some indirect, um, um, let's say more, there are some indications that this DNA, of course, could be bound through steric interaction, electrostatic interactions, yeah. or it could be bound specifically through proteins. So there are these, um, these uh, Q proteins, Q70 and 80, which were, let's say, identified in cell, in, on cell surface to bind to DNA, and were also in, identified in proteomic studies on urine EVs to be present mm -hmm. in EVs. And of of course, also histones are known to bind to um, surface of EVs, and this could be also one way of protection. Uh, let's go to Tom Kroll next. You have a question about rejection. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Nice, nice talk, Mecca. I really enjoyed it. Thank I've you. had the opportunity to work in nephrology before, and I think this is a really important question. And you've sort of alluded to this, but in acute rejection, we typically mm -hmm. have antibody response, and in in chronic rejection, it's usually T cell mediated. And so are you able to differentiate the acute condition ver versus the chronic condition in what you found? Um, so um, the problem is um, in our, not the problem, but the, let's say the limitation of our study was that um, we only had 10 patients that really, um, that had diagnosed rejection. On the other hand, you can look at this like, wow, the center is doing great. You know, the kidney transplants are working nicely. So um, from, the, from this point of view, of course, this is perfect, but it's more difficult to, um, to enroll these patients. But we have been doing this now for, I think, like two or three years. So we have like a larger cohort with um, different time, um, like a um, time, so different times of um, data collection and we'll have, we'll be able to really go into this to be more um, clinically relevant. So, but at this moment, what we could show is that there was a difference in one of these DNA um, characteristics between antibody mediated and T cell mediated rejection. So there is a, you know, there's a hope that um, this could be something that we could work on further. Thank you. Thanks for the question. And our next one is from uh, Kirsten. Is it Stemmer or Stemmer? I'm sitting here in Germany, so I want to get your name right. <laughs> yeah, hi from Germany as well. It's uh, Stemmer. <laughs> uh, some rather technical questions. Mm -hmm. so all, thanks for this talk. It was really exciting and uh, excellent. Um, it's more about apoptotic bodies. So there will be a lot of uh, apoptosis going on in the rejection phenotypes. Do you think this could be another source of DNA that is contributing? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, for the apoptotic bodies, um, it's a very, very complex um, question. And I was looking at the literature and Ken, I actually thought like, we have to do a workshop on apoptotic bodies, <laughs> you know, because it's, um, I think this field, I mean, it, it's just really unknown. First, it was like, okay, apoptotic bodies are just bigger, basic, like um, are only always larger, you know, in size. But then now you see it literature and it goes like, oh, it can be really small, like um, smaller EVs, or it can go to big 
bigger sizes. And now how to differentiate all this? I mean, it's uh, quite difficult. I don't know if, if we really know how to identify apoptotic bodies now. But I would say that um, from what I know is that for the apoptotic bodies, I would assume that um, DNA would be inside of EVs. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I would assume that, but of course, that doesn't mean that um, this DNA that is bound on the surface is not from the <clears throat> apoptotic process. You know, it could be released with apoptosis, but um, bound in a different way, but I would assume that, I don't know, for the larger vesicles, we actually, um, because we're doing this uh, sec isolation, um, I think that, um, uh, in these columns, at least from what we observed, we do remove the largest vesicles. So we didn't look at that specifically. And maybe if we would focus more on these larger vesicles in size, like more than 400 or 500 nanometers in diameter, maybe we would find more of the apoptotic um, vesicles. And maybe they would be even um, really informative. So we just didn't, we didn't exactly. get to this point. But yeah, yes, exactly. I am very interested in learning more about ap apoptotic vesicles. It yeah, just... because it wouldn't matter at the end of the day if it's the apoptotic yeah. body that gives yeah. you the response yeah. and uh, yeah. the biomarker aspect. Yeah. It, it would be yeah. fine as well. Yeah, yeah, but agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the question. I like the idea of the workshop too. Um, but, but, you know, I would even take this a little bit further it's kind of a philosophical question what what is an extracellular vesicle you know i think that in my 2018 we defined it as something that is naturally released by the cell mm -hmm. but what about what about uh vesicles that form when a cell dies necrotically yeah. you know so we we what what do we call those i mean mm -hmm. I, are those evs are they not evs yeah. um and 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 again i mean I, kirsten's point is very good it doesn't really matter if you have a good biomarker mm -hmm. um but but uh you know i, I think that um i, I believe that sheree blank iran has described these things as deathosomes um you know <laughs> so so we have this dogma in cell culture that we can't have more than five percent death or you know, too many of the EVs are coming from the dead cells. Mm -hmm. But in vivo, you can have a lot of a mm -hmm. lot of EVs that mm -hmm. could be coming from even you know necrotically dying cells. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, I think worth worth thinking about those those yeah. um, whatever we want to call them, not just the the apoptotic yeah. bodies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's go to John Bissler next. That was really a fabulous talk. Thank you so much. I'm excited as a pediatric nephrologist. You can separate out the groups of rejection and not rejection, but only as a group. So my question is, do you think you would be able to track, make it like a trending thing? Have you thought about those future experiments? Mm -hmm. That if you watched a single patient, you could identify well before you saw a change in function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is this is what we actually hope. So um, we have um, uh, we we are um, following the patients for one year um, because then in one year there is this um, biopsy surveillance biopsy. So we have to have this biopsy so that we know if the patient has a diagnosed rejection or maybe some other injuries or not. And um, from there, of course, when we have this data point, we just have all these different samples that are, were collected before that. I think that there's like five or six different data points um, that we have. And we'll just look at when, like the trends, you know, can we see any trends? Can we see changes that would indicate before we could see this um, injury being visible? That, that would be fabulous. The other thing I would offer is something to think about is different patients are more sensitive to the calcineurins uh, yeah. uh, inhibitors. And so you might be able to also find uh, calcineurin inhibitor toxicity versus rejection. Mm -hmm. You might mm -hmm. be able to define mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thank you so much. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. To, to comment uh, that, so um, luckily we have all the patients that were included had uh, like very similar um, um, treatment uh, re regime. So they all were treated with um, uh, calcineurin inhibitors and um, some other steroids and stuff. So, um, but the thing is that um, like in this non-rejection um, group, of course, we do observe, uh, this is a very heterogeneous group. I know that from the clinical point, I said, I won't even, um, I don't want to go there because it's so complicated. But luckily, um, we really collaborate with Professor Anol on that and he's 
he you know he really knows his things and he helps us in that regard but there is um, a lot of variability in the different causes that can also cause injury so we'll have to be really careful how to interpret the data but we hope with bigger la uh, larger cohorts and more data points maybe we can start digging into that so definitely oh, interested yes <laughs> Thanks for the insightful comments, John. And I'm glad to see that we also have a, a canine member of the EV club today who's uh, there, there beside you. So that's great. Um, let's move and let next to, uh, to Catherine Miller Haskell. Hi. Um, so I do have a really large set of questions, but I guess uh, so they, they have been mostly answered. So I actually want to know um, about the healthy kidneys versus the injured kidneys. And I'm curious if you found difference is in the in the quant in quantitation of DNA, so the, the amount of DNA that's passing through. Um, you did say that you weren't sure where the DNA was originating from. So mm -hmm. I was curious if um, if normal kidneys are like don't have as much DNA as injured ones. Mm -hmm. And also um, the motivation between uh, EV associated DNA versus just DNA that's in urine in general. Um. Um, so ho I, I, hopefully I will, um, I understood the whole question. So the first uh, to comment on um, differences from healthy kidney or the, um, this, um, let's say different um, injuries. Um, so of course this will, we only looked at um, kidney allografts. So these were only transplanted kidneys, um, but we did observe by, for, by measuring DNA yield or um, so DNA copy numbers, we could observe statistically significant differences between all three patient groups, but even the difference was, let's say, um, we could specifically then show with pairways um, um, analysis that, um, let's say, the um, rejection group had, um, I don't know, uh, more DNA copies compared to the normal group. So we could observe these differences between the patient groups. Um, and um, I didn't show the, the self-free um, self DNA data so much, but they are included in the paper. Um, it's just like, it was not enough time to, to just do everything. But um, self-free DNA actually has, um, shows, re acts really similarly to EV DNA in all these different association studies, in all these different um, Aspect. So at least in our hands, um, it could be an interchangeable um, also biomarker or let's say indicator of kidney um, injury. Um, but we think that with um, EVs, we can now go dig into the, um, the source of EVs, the, the parent, you know, the parent, the cell type source of EVs. Um, while if you only have cell-free DNA, you're just stuck there. So we hope to get more composite biomarkers with continuing on EVs. But for this specific, um, let's say in this specific case, the, actually the biomarkers were quite interchangeable for self-free DNA okay. and EV DNA. Thanks, Catherine. And, and Clotilde, does that answer your question? Yes, in fact, yes. I was just <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention that we have had exactly the same kind of, of analysis on plasma derived uh, oh, DNA in nice. cancer patients, and we have a paper on 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 that. That uh, and our conclusion was that in fact that EVs would not really bring any more information than the total mm -hmm. DNA. But mm -hmm. maybe we didn't dig into it. Yeah. No, no, the thing yeah. is, I mean, in a way it's true. And, you know, it's it's still fine. I mean, if self-free DNA will be a perfect biomarker for the, uh, it's great that we get to know so much about fundamental EV, um, biology of EVs. But I totally agree. Why complicate and do all these uh, difficult EV isolations if you can just do anal analysis of self-free DNA? But um, let's say in, at least in cancer, or maybe also here, um, when you start, let's say, if you want to look at um, epigenetic modifications, if you want to look at sequences, um, specific sequences, or just maybe some, like I said, more composite, if you can, if you want to look at more composite biomarkers, then EVDNA has longer DNA fragments. So it's much easier to 
this data is then more informative. And we could also show, let's say, for the um, EV DNA, um, the assays that we had to um, that we um, used for SNP identifications. Um, for EV DNA, it was much easier to um, to um, design them because you had longer fragments, and you could, you had to be more careful with cell-free DNA. But on the other hand, with cell-free DNA, you have more DNA. So again, you maybe have that's the the better part. So it's yeah, it's definitely not a straightforward thing. It's definitely not um, really obvious. Yeah. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, I, I, I recognize that we're well over the hour now. Um, thanks to everybody who's holding on here. We do have um, just just three more questions. So I'd like to get to them if, you, if, if you're willing to do that, Metka, but I'm going to read them in the interest of time. Um, so Azam Mahmoudi Aznave asks, thanks. Very great talk. How can you distinguish between the different kinds of inflammation here? Or are you are you doing that? Okay, no, no, definitely not. I'm not. Uh, so there is a, um, a dedicated pathologist um, which specializes and does um, also clinically uh, does all this um, um, biopsy analysis, histopathologic analysis. So this was just data that was um, that was part of the study that we got. But this is actually just part of the clinical procedure. This is what they do for clinical um, evaluation. Um, Good. And then we have a question from Abraham uh, Tahai, who asks, did you try to correlate protein and DNA in the rejected kidneys? So in other words, do you have access to that tissue and, and, and could you do a correlation? Um, so we have tissue still. Um, um, we have collected tissue, but we didn't go into any, we didn't go look into that now uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. We'll definitely continue with the studies and hope to do more. Very good. And then May Mahoney asks, I'm sorry if I missed this uh, from your talk, which is beautiful, by the way, congratulations. Uh, but is there any evidence that these EV DNAs could be functional? Okay, yeah, I mean, the like DNA, I think uh, we need volunteers to work on EV DNA because it's just like a really understudied topic. So the functions, they say like, okay, maybe um, it could be um, horizontal DNA transfer, or maybe this is just to remove toxic DNA so, um, so that cell doesn't go into apoptosis or another hypothesis is um, that it affects um, immune um, response. But yeah, I think that there's, yeah, we just have to do that. I mean, there's it could be it could be possible that it, it even pro propagates the inflammation, but um, we didn't do any experiments in that direction. May does that does that answer the question, or did you or any of the other questioners want to follow up? Um, yeah, she did answer my question. Thank you. <laughs> it's something that we all struggle with when we study anything in vesicles, right? I mean, we our lab we study uh, microRNAs, and mm -hmm. the big question is always is there a function for those yeah. microRNAs? Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious, mm -hmm. you know, when you publish your papers, how do you address those questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so as I said, this paper was more focused on um, really characterizing all that and then just showing that there is some potential in the biomarker, but um, we just didn't get to the functional part yet. Um, yeah, that, that will be probably quite uh, complicated. Um, I don't know, probably we'll have to do it in vitro on some systems. I mean, it's just like the whole big project, um, another big project. So yeah, but definitely worth um, digging into. Yeah. Very good. Well, we will conclude there. And I just want to thank everybody for joining today and for all the great questions that, that have come in. This is a really good discussion. And uh, Metka, to you and your team, again, thank you for this work and thank you for presenting it today. So I look forward to seeing everybody again at a, another edition of the EV Club. Um, as, you, as you may have noticed over the last few weeks, we have several new moderators. So Metka is one of those moderators. Clotilde Terry is another one. Um, and it's great to have it's it's great to have more people involved in the in the in the EV club. Um, so um, so so thanks thanks to both of you as well. Um, so take care everybody. Hope you have a good rest of the week and uh, good luck with your experiments and everything you're doing. Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.